I'm going to welcome everyone. I know that there might be some more folks jumping in, but my name is Olivia Zink, Executive Director at Open Democracy. And we are so excited to have Spencer and Manuela from Rethink Media here um, to, to lead us through this digital, um, digital or organizing workshop. Um, we will have time for questions and answers, and we will be recording today's workshop. So if you do not like, want to be shown on screen, you can turn your video off. Um, but I'm going to hand it over to Spencer. Awesome. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for letting us join uh, and have this time with you all today. Um, before we get started, um, and I believe we're already recording, correct? So um, we wanted to go over a little bit of housekeeping, uh, just in case folks are newer to Zoom. Uh, so we really encourage folks to go ahead and turn on your video camera. You should have the ability to unmute yourself. We've set aside time throughout today's presentation for Q&A. We want to have some group discussion about some of the subjects and, and, and topics we're going to be discussing today. But also want to just point out that at the bottom of your screen, there should be a chat box. So we're going to be referring to that throughout as well. So if there's any burning questions that come up, uh, any comments, we'll also be asking you a couple of questions as well. Feel free to use that chat box as an alternate to unmuting yourself throughout. And if you do have any technical questions, any trouble um, hearing or seeing the presentation, please let us know in the chat box and we'll do all, our best to troubleshoot those issues. Um, great. Well, thanks everyone and, and welcome to our training on digital organizing and communication. I hope everyone is doing well and staying healthy and taking care of themselves and their community during these difficult times. Um, before we begin, we want to share a quick note about our organization, uh, Rethink Media. We are a nonprofit uh, communication shop focusing on capacity building and supporting the media efforts of advocacy groups working in nuclear security, advancing civil rights for Muslim, Arab, and South Asian people, and building a healthy democracy. We do all sorts of things at Rethink, from conducting trainings like today on media skills and messaging, to helping advocates develop and execute communication strategies, analyzing the media landscape and providing uh, tracking around public opinion. But today we're gonna focus on talking about digital organizing and communications with an emphasis on using social media to engage and mobilize audiences to action. So we wanna learn a little bit more about each one of you. Um, so we're gonna introduce ourselves, but if everyone can go ahead and in that chat box, just share your name, your organizational affiliation, if you have one, and your location. Um, so I'll kick things off. Uh, my name, again, is Spencer Olson. I'm the Associate Director of our democracy team at Rethink Media. We work on issues related to voting rights, getting big money out of politics, and uh, ensuring fair and impartial uh, courts. I've worked in the nonprofit and campaign space for the past 10 years. I've been with Rethink for the last year and a half. And prior to joining Rethink, worked uh, in Washington state politics on a variety of different campaigns, mostly focused on voting rights and getting big money out of politics, and did a lot of work uh, on digital organizing and, and communication. So I'm very excited to be with you today. And also joining me is my colleague, Manuela Okoo, uh, who I'll let introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Manuela Okoo. I'm a media associate on the democracy team at Rethink Media. I work alongside Spencer on all of the issues that he just mentioned um, with the primary focus on money in politics. Um, I've been with Rethink for about a year and a half. And before that, I spent a number of years working on education policy. And for all of you Granny D fans, Manuela walked with us on the Granny D walk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> awesome. And thank you all for chatting in where you're at. It's, it's really helpful for us to get a snapshot of where, where people are based. So um, now that we got introductions out of the way, uh, let's take a look at our goals for today's workshop. So first we want everyone to leave with a deeper understanding of why digital organizing and social media are so important for creating social change. We also wanna learn about case studies that effectively engaged audiences online and discuss the techniques that were deployed that achieved success. And then we also are gonna spend time at the end talking about communications, uh, which is key to engaging folks and moving them to action online. So we wanna learn about the best messaging frames for discussing democracy reforms, specifically on money and politics, 
while also touching upon some of the best practices and strategies for bringing a broader democracy narrative to life. Um, so Olivia, if you wanna go ahead and, and launch the poll, we have a quick icebreaker to also learn a little bit more about your level and uh, skill around social media. So we have three questions if you wanna go ahead and uh, put in your vote here. Uh, what is your favorite social media platform for getting news? You mean people get news from social media? <laughs> news and information. <laughs> news through uh, someone else's perspective, for sure. Uh, we also want to know what is your favorite platform for engaging your friends and family on, on social media? And the last question we have is what platform, what social media platform do you want to become more effective at using? So Olivia, I don't, have we gotten through all three questions? I don't see the questions up there. I um, don't either. So the first one came through, but not the other two. Okay. So do I have to, to okay, we, we're gonna share yeah, the, the first one here, it looks like most folks selected Facebook, uh, not shockingly, as their primary uh, tool if they do use social media to get news and information. And then the second question here, I never got the second question. Okay, here we go. Be up on your screen right now. Oh, I don't okay. think anyone did sec the second question, so. Oh, engaging friends and family. Hmm. We're curious to hear what, what are the popular tools in New Hampshire? But you don't give us multiple choice. <laughs> nope, your favorite, what's your go-to? But what if we go to three of them at a lot? Or Which what if we go to none of them a lot? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got Facebook, uh, what also some Twitter and, and some Facebook Messenger. And then the last question here, we're curious to hear which of these, of the platforms below, do you wanna become more effective at using? Mm -hmm. Can we do more than one on this? Uh, I, is it set up that way? I think so. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is Tumblr? <laughs> uh, we're actually not going to go too deep into Tumblr. It was far even... <laughs> popular a couple years ago, but it's, it's sort of in between Twitter and Eva, Facebook. don't laugh at me. You're, you're dating yourself, Kim. <laughs> I know. I, <laughs> that's okay. I'm just as bad as you are, so don't worry about it. <laughs> but I keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I don't know what Tumblr is either. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> well, don't worry, because it's less relevant to our work today than it was oh, a few years ago. Good. Um, so it looks like we have a winner here around Twitter, uh, while also folks want to learn more about yeah. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and then one person mentioned TikTok, um, which is great because we're actually going to center those top four a little bit later on in our presentation. <laughs> I know TikTok is bad. That's what I heard from the cops. <laughs> That's what I heard too. That I have all than that. I have no clue what it even is. My 11-year-old my 11 granddaughter uses it, so I want to get understand it better. Oh, oh yeah, you should. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can touch on TikTok a little bit later on. No worries. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for filling out the poll. It helps us kind of know how to center today's conversation. Um, but first, again, we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we know we're all living in a very difficult time. Our lives, our work, and our communities have been deeply impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. And for many of us, democracy advocates, our plans and strategies are rapidly shifting to better meet today's unique challenges. So engaging people online is more important now than ever. As we all practice social distancing to flatten the curve, it's important for us to stay connected, continue to make our voices heard and meet people where they're at. And right now, that's gonna be at home, uh, on social media and on video chats like today on Zoom. But luckily for all of us, the digital tools we are now using in our daily lives to stay connected with friends and family 
have been around for years and organizations like Open Democracy and Rethink and others have had great success deploying digital strategies that help replicate what advocates have traditionally done offline to a more digital space, whether that's hosting community events, tabling at your local fair, phone banking members, or canvassing people at home. The only difference is that we're using online tools and virtual organizing to recruit, engage, and call people to action. And that's why we're here today. We're gonna provide you with the tools and strategies to both organize people to action and communicate an effective money in politics and democracy reform message online. But first, we're gonna start with digital organizing. So what, what is digital organizing? We define it uh, simply as achieving two key outcomes. First is getting people interested, and second is getting people to help. And this definition probably sounds very similar to those of you who have already been active in your community, and that's really on purpose. Uh, the goals are the same as traditional offline organizing, but the strategies and tactics we are using are online and we're working either individually or in teams remotely together. So we're gonna to focus today's training on how you, as an individual, or as someone who's part of an online small team of people, can use online tools and strategies to engage your existing networks to organize collective action online. So um, to entertain me, let's all go ahead and put our digital organizer hats on for today. So as that digital organizer, uh, it's important to remember to be human. Bring people in with your story of political involvement, your unique perspective or experience with the issues and make it local and relevant to your community. Stories thrive online and are a great way to spark interest. But also remember that you're also working to inspire action indirectly by showing others what you are doing online to take action while also making those direct asks, encouraging other people to join you. So how do you get started as, as a digital organizer? First, I want you to start thinking about the digital tools and social media platforms that you are already actively using to communicate with others. It might be Facebook, Twitter, Zoom, or simply texting or emailing people. All of these are effective tools to build networks engage those networks and mobilize those networks of people to take action online. You are also the messenger and your audiences are your friends, your family and your acquaintances who you are already connected with on social media. And collectively, we have a lot of power just with those networks alone. So I'm curious, go ahead and unmute yourself or put it in the chat box. Um, how many friends do you think the average Facebook user has? Curious, um, so, so far people chatted in 1,500, 300. Oh. Oh. Other thoughts on the average number of Facebook users? Oh, 1,000. 1,000? Yeah. Really? So the actual number is 338. <laughs> so it looks like Marsha so is the winner. Go, Marsha. <laughs> uh, almost exactly there. Yeah, so the average Facebook user has about 300 friends. And collectively, that's a lot of people that you can reach, a lot of people that hopefully you know, you trust, you have a relationship with. So imagine the potential if every one of us were able to activate our existing network to take action or to make their voice heard on important issues. Now, if you have never used Facebook or a Facebook group, don't worry. They are very easy to learn and Manuela will walk us through some of the best practices a little later on in our presentation. So also our friends and family aren't the only people using and influenced by social media. Right now, the media landscape is in the midst of a total transformation. Technology is changing how we talk to each other and how we access news and information. But that's really only the beginning. Social media is so crucial to us as advocates because it's the locus of social change. It's a place where people amplify each other's stories, learn about what's happening in their communities, consume the news, and activate their passions. And according to a 2018 Pew Research survey, almost seven in 10 Americans agree that social media is important for getting elected officials to pay attention to our issues. And nearly six in 10 say social media is important for influencing policy decisions. Social media is the digital town square and lawmakers and journalists are listening. 
So it's important for all of us to be active online and help shape the conversation. So just a quick note uh, to help set the stage for how we're gonna be framing today's conversation. There are many different ways to use social media. And here we've tried to distill it down into three primary levels represented by these three interlocking circles. You have the individual level, the organizational or campaign, and the collaborative. The individual level of engagement is about chatting with your friends or family as an individual person. It's using our own individual personal accounts. You know, building your profile as a trusted spokesperson or just a trusted voice in your community. And you can have a lot of leeway about what you're saying because you're really only representing yourself. The second is the organizational or campaign level, which is about conveying information to members of an organization or that campaign, calling people to action, building momentum on the road to change. And this is how organizations and campaigns engage on social media, often with their official profiles or pages. And then the third level is what we're calling the collaborative level of engagement, which is about fostering dialogue organically among our community or others in more digital forums. It's about tapping into broader online conversations and cultural spaces. And here we're encouraging others to develop their own perspectives sympathetic to our issues. And a good example of this level of social media are Facebook groups, which Manuel will talk about a little bit more, but it's, it's more of a space where we all can contribute, we all can participate in the, in the conversation. So um, we went through each of these. And so for today, we're just gonna be focusing on the individual and the collaborative levels. We want us to leave feeling ready to take on using our own individual accounts to, to engage and activate our audiences of friends and our own networks and talk a little bit more about how we can effectively participate in those shared digital spaces to organize and shape the public discourse. So it's also important to understand that digital organizing is also about messaging. You can't have good organizing without good communications and vice versa. Uh, you cannot move people to action and persuade them to join if you lack a compelling message that resonates with them. So what is a good message? Um, well, first, it just is really two key bullet points here. It should capture and keep your audience's attention. And second, it should move them to action, whether that's to like your content, comment on it, click the link and sign the petition. You want to move them to some sort of desired outcome. So how many folks here, uh, raise a hand or a thumbs up, are familiar with Facebook's newsfeed? Okay, I'm seeing most hands here. As you can see in this, this visual here, the, the, the infinite scroll of the, the feed on social media, uh, the newsfeed is that central hub that you see when you first open Facebook. It's an endless stream of posts, videos, and ads that Facebook curates for you. Some are from your friends, others are from brands or campaigns or businesses. And most social media platforms have that, this very similar kind of homepage where all of the content's aggregated together. But it's easy for your content to get lost in this feed as we're scrolling through it. So here we want to walk through some of the important tips for how do you message your content so it really pops in this endless scrolling kind of feature of social media. So the first is you want to keep it short and simple. Character counts are really important on social media. And sometimes there's hard character counts, especially on Twitter, for how long a post can be. And so most people are scrolling, so keep that in mind. It's best to keep your messages short that, so that people don't have to expand what you've written. Even on Facebook, it will shorten it. You need to click see more for folks to see the, the full length of your post. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But remember that you can always add additional content or additional even news articles as a thread in your Twitter. You can respond to your own Twitter posts. Same on Facebook. In that comment section, you can put more content there. So think about what you're putting at the top of your posts to capture their attention and bring them into the conversation with you. Second, it's important to tell people what to do. Don't leave it ambiguous uh, and don't assume that people know what actions matter. Link to those petition pages, sign up forms, or, or include those important phone numbers, especially if you're asking people to call their local lawmakers. Also, um, lean into your own voice and your own sense of humor. You are the messenger as an individual digital organizer. Make it personal and be authentic. Use visuals. Images thrive on social media and help grab people's attention while they are scrolling. 
Consider the shape and dimensions of the images you're posting, whether that's landscape or portrait, there's different optimizations you wanna think about for the different platforms. And action shots are always a great go-to of showing people doing something, of modeling that taking action and that behavior. And then lastly, it's important to think about how you can join the conversation. Social media is all about two-way conversations. Join those hashtags that are popular on the issues or popular in your community, respond to people's comments, answer people's questions, thank them when they take action and comment on other people's posts. And so I wanna show an example here of how this kind of all comes together and especially how you can replicate an offline action online. And then after we go through this, we're gonna pause for a few minutes to answer any of the burning questions that you all have. So Manuel and I both work really closely with a coalition of organizations and Open Democracy is one of those organizations. Uh, there's 140 plus organizations in a coalition that's working to pass HR1, also known as the For the People Act. Uh, it's a bold, visionary bill in Congress that would address voting rights, money in politics, and government ethics. And after Democrats took control of the House of Representatives in 2019, the first bill introduced by Speaker Pelosi was HR1. It quickly passed the House, but was, and sadly still is, stalled in the Senate by Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. But we as a coalition didn't want to back down. So we decided to continue organizing to elevate HR1 and the need for democracy reform. And we did that by using the Democratic presidential primary debates as a vehicle for a sparking public debate. We kicked off a campaign on social media focused on this hashtag, ask about democracy, and organized a series of what we call tweet storms before each debate to put pressure on debate moderators to include a question about democracy reform specific to HR1. And so for those um, on the call, I'm curious, uh, hands or thumbs up, if, have you ever participated or heard of a tweet storm? Just curious. Okay, a couple of folks here. So for those who are less familiar, a tweet storm is uh, trying to replicate a town hall on Twitter. It's open to the public, anyone can join in. You really just need to utilize a specific hashtag. Uh, it's free to set up. What's also critical is that it's organized. So in this sense, these tweet storms that we've been organizing, there's an hour that everyone sets aside where they go ahead and join the conversation uh, put their tweets out there, all use the same hashtag uh, to help generate action and try to make this become trending, whether that's locally or nationally on Twitter. So in this specific example, we set a goal. We wanted to generate hundreds of tweets during this one hour time slot that we set aside. We actually set us, we created a Facebook event for folks to know when it was going on they could register and we knew they were gonna participate. We centered our audience. We wanted to have 140 organizations, all of them in the coalition participate and then get their members to join in. And then we made a plan and provided tools, which I think is key to have a successful tweet storm. So we drafted up templates and sample posts. We created some sample graphics, and then we lifted up in real time and shared all the great uh, tweets we're getting from allies to have them retweet it and share it on uh, Twitter as well. So as you can see here on this screen, we had a couple celebrities join us, including Kerry Washington and Ed Helms, and we were able to reach over 5 million people on Twitter by generating uh, just over 1,000 posts from 750 people. So tweet storms are, are a great example of how to do this, but what's also nice is they're scalable. So while this is a national example, I've done these in the past at the very local level. You know, you could target your city council, your county commissioners, just think about um, your local reporters. There's a great way to do this. It's really just important about that prep work. Um, so we're gonna pause here for a couple minutes. Any questions so far about any of the content that we've gone over? So okay. do you yeah. think Twitter has a farther reach than Facebook? Great question. Um, it does not, and Manuel is actually gonna talk about that in the next section. We're gonna break down a few of these social media platforms, who they reach, what demographics. Great question, and if we can pin that, we'll come to that in a couple minutes. I also wanna ask if you'll address um, reach versus engagement on Facebook. I mean, I know how far I reach on some things, um, and engagement is just when they click on one of the likes or whatever, or, or take an action. Can you expand on that a little bit? Because I was going to ask that same question about what those are. 
Yeah, great question. So when evaluating the impact of a social media campaign or even a social media post, uh, and th these terms are relevant to both Twitter and Facebook primarily, reach means how many people that content reached. Whether they engaged with it or read it, it doesn't tell you that, but it showed up in their, in their scrolling of their newsfeed. It reached that many people. So in this example, the tweets from we reached over 5 million people. Engagement is measuring how many people actually engage with the content. And that includes liking it, commenting on it, sharing it. And so I would say if you are running a more comprehensive social media program, engagement is how you want to measure success on how well it's performing because you're actually actively getting people to engage with your content. Whereas reach, you're not really sure if it, if they consumed it, if it resonated with them, but it did show up uh, on their social media uh, newsfeed. Spencer, in terms of engagement, um, is it just the numbers of engagement? Because what if 75% uh, of the people say they hate your idea? They're engaged, <laughs> they're responding, but that ain't good for our efforts. To, to, well, that's why you can't just look at Facebook analytics and insights. You have to also, you should go through the comments, see what people are saying. That learning is really helpful because that, that's lesson. If you're seeing that you're posting something and most of the comments you're getting aren't uh, ideally what you want to see, Maybe you want to rethink your strategy or the audience that you're centered. Um, and that can be common, especially if you're running ads on these platforms. You might not be actually hitting or reaching the folks that you, you want to be centering. So great point. Um, but engagement, sometimes even those, but if you think about it in Facebook's algorithm, the more engagement your content gets, the more likely it's going to put it in other people's news feed. So one thing I would recommend doing is you definitely want to keep track of the comments that you're getting, but all of that engagement can help it reach more people who might follow your page or be your friends and on your individual Facebook account. Is, is there a way we can find out that you mentioned the algorithm that Facebook uses? So we're not going to get into the nitty gritty on that right now. And Facebook constantly changes it. We actually have a great blog post that we can make sure we share with Olivia to share with you about some of those changes and tweaks that have been made in the last year. We know that Facebook has deprioritized such like advocacy pages and brands and reemphasized um, posts that are coming from your friends and family. So right now as a, an individual, using social media to engage your friends and networks, this is a great time to do that because Facebook did adjust its algorithm to put more of our content at the top and less the content that's coming from big brands. Great, well, we're gonna move to the next section and can continue to hold some of your questions or put them in the chat box. We have a couple more sections where we're gonna pause for that Q&A. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic over to Manuela who's gonna break down the top platforms that we should be using uh, on social media. Thanks, Spencer. Um, so if this is, if you're new to the world of uh, social media, there is no end of social media tools, platforms, and apps. Um, literally a new tool is being created every day. And so while this can be overwhelming, if you're just getting started with all of this, it's okay to focus on just one. Um, for example, the one you're already using. Recall your responses to our icebreaker polls earlier in the conversation, the platform that you're using to get your news, or the platform that you're using to stay connected with friends and family, or perhaps a platform that uh, you, you want to learn a little bit more about. If you're still not sure, that's okay, uh, uh, because we recommend starting with these four in this order, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. So let's start with Facebook. If you only have time for one platform, make it Facebook. Uh, this is the big one because nearly everyone has a Facebook profile. Um, some cool things that you can use with your, your personal Facebook profile is to um, engage your friends, your community, to issues you care about and want them to engage around. You can share news and other important developments that, they, that you think they should see or may have missed. You can even host or share upcoming events like webinars, days of actions, online trainings, or Facebook Live um, events. Another great thing or great use of Facebook is its groups or its groups. Uh, you can start a group or join one, and these are basically intimate, closed uh, areas on Facebook where you can cultivate uh, online community around a specific issue or topic. 
So I'm curious who here has joined a Facebook group. Um, raise your hand or share in the chat which group you're currently active on or in. So here is an example of a Facebook group, one you're probably familiar with, uh, the Indivisible, the New Hampshire chapter of Indivisible. Remember the groups are structured or structured space on Facebook where users can opt in to a closed, public, private, or even secret group uh, based on a shared interest. So cooking recipes, for example, or neighborhood groups or uh, groups that are tailored towards specific shows or, or artists. Uh, where people have uh, similar interests. And so what Facebook groups, like the power of Facebook groups, here's an example of one um, of how you can you, you leverage a group uh, to make meaningful change. Uh, started by two teachers in West Virginia uh, a, few, a year or so ago, a Facebook group to organize teachers and allies planning a strike quickly grew over to quickly grew to over 2,000 people and was a central place uh, where people, a part of this movement, shared details about upcoming events. They created memes and other graphics to uh, let off frustration, and it all culminated in helping achieve a successful strike. Uh, Facebook groups um, overall, Facebook overall, but groups in particular is, are a helpful resource for grassroots base building and fostering a community around an issue or goal. All right, so let's turn now to Twitter. It's different from Facebook in that less people, everyday people use it and are on it and mostly journalists kind of uh, take the, the helm of, of this platform. Breaking news often happens here first uh, because, again, journalists, a lot of journal journalists are active on it. If you have a, a Twitter account or you want to start one, here's, here are a couple of things you can do with it. First, it's a great place to engage and follow reporters because this is kind of where they live online. Um, it's another great way or a place to share news or shout out lawmakers in your state who are doing good work. You can also uh, follow in... Um, tag your posts or your tweets uh, with local hashtags like New Hampshire Paul, uh, New Hampshire Senate, hashtag New Hampshire House when you're tweeting on, on, tw on Twitter or even posting to Facebook about politics and legislation um, in your state. So I'm curious how many of you are familiar with local uh, hashtags for New Hampshire politics or have used them before? You can share them in the chat, share others that you're familiar with. Another reason why it's important to pay attention to Twitter is that tweets themselves are newsworthy. So it's fairly common practice for a news story to be made up of nothing but embedded tweets, um, letting experts or just regular people uh, speak for themselves. So here's a screenshot of, of, of a recent article late last year from the Huffington Post. Senate, around that time, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell described one provision in the HR bill, HR1 bill as uh, a power grab by Democrats. And people, lots of people disagreed with him um, and got pretty vocal on Twitter about it. And it, it generated enough buzz uh, that a story was born and the tweets themselves were featured in the news article, which is what you're saying on your screen. So I'm curious how you could, how you think you could see a, a political moment happening right now in New Hampshire or in the future in a similar way, and what key uh, hashtags would you use? We can share those in the in the chat. So let's now turn to Instagram. Instagram is primarily built to be a photo and video sharing site, and the audiences uh, on Instagram are, tend to be a lot younger and more racially diverse. If you want to make the best use of Instagram, a couple of things you can do with a personal account is to it's is to use it to reach younger audiences. So perhaps you're you know trying to tap into um, younger audiences to to, to drive your um, actions and, and and work forward. Instagram is another great place that you can use to show your followers uh, behind the scenes footage of action you're participating in. Um, people really like the up up and close up close and personal kind of aspects of organizing um, and activism. Instagram is also another great place uh, to have if you have good visuals like photos or short videos that you think others would find interesting, you could post it on using this platform. The most important feature on Instagram, however, is 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 its stories feature. And these are stories are off the cuff images 
or videos um, that are accessible for 24 hours only on the site before it kind of disappears, which is what part of what makes it fascinating. Facebook also has a, ver have a, version, has a version of stories as well that works in a similar way. If you're not familiar with um, Instagram stories, here's a great example of someone using it very, very effectively, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Um, as a, she, she's been able to use the stories feature on Instagram to make Congress more transparent with short and formal videos explaining what it's like to be a new member of Congress and the youngest member of co Congress from her personal perspective. Instagram, Instagram stories is a great ex technique to employ because it's not resource intensive. So you don't need a whole, uh, you don't, you don't need a lot of digital tech or expensive tech for, for that matter. All it really requires is a phone, internet connection, and an interesting moment to capture and share. So I'm curious, what might you create on Instagram or Facebook story uh, about or for to capture for your audiences? Um, feel free to share them in the chat or if you've use the stories um, before share that as well and what you what you featured so finally our last platform for today is youtube youtube is primarily a video sharing site where anyone can post and watch videos on any number of topics so it's a it's similar to instagram with the it's it's primary video function but it's more for long form videos uh, or longer videos than than shorts which is uh, best used for Instagram think of YouTube as the Google version for for all things video content a couple of things you can use YouTube um, for uh, one as I said to create these longer videos like an explainer video if you want to break down a complex concept or bill and help people to understand it as well as to connect with influencers on on the site and basically influencers are people who have a large following and a large base who may be open to helping you amplify your message uh, to a wider audience if you engage them in the right way. So while Facebook is probably the most important platform to be active on, don't be uh, so quick to write off YouTube since social distancing um, has increased all of our uh, reliance on video content to do everything from host webinars like this, like this one trainings, digital town halls, or even just do regular day-to-day -day meetings. So to wrap up, remember that each platform has its own strengths and weaknesses um, that will help shape how you decide to use it. For reaching new audiences, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube are probably your best bets. But if you want to promote an upcoming event, uh, definitely use Facebook. If you want to take a stab at trying to engage reporters and get getting their attention, definitely you definitely want to turn to Twitter. And if you want to give your followers a sneak peek behind the scenes, consider Instagram. And then for those long uh, explainer videos, definitely uh, turn to YouTube. So now we're going to take a look at another case study, and this one a little closer to home, New Hampshire. I'm going to pass it over to Olivia, who will walk us through how Open Democracy leveraged the power of digital ads on Facebook to put pressure on a state senator to get behind a public financing bill being considered in the legislature. So Olivia, take it away. Sure. Um, so one of the things that we did is, or uh, with the help of Rethink is created a, a couple of different images. Um, and we did three images. And I thought for sure that the strengthening your voice image would be the best image. But in fact, it wasn't. New Hampshire values democracy was what the image that tested and resonated best with folks. Um, so it's really interesting to sort of be begin to test messages to see which, or test images to see which one performs a little bit better. Um, we also really use this as a way for people to email their senator. Um, and so we uh, took action. But um, as you can see, um, you know, there's different ways to do it. But this was, these were paid advertisements. But I think this also works when you're not using paid advertisements, when you're encouraging people to contact their senators. Great. Uh, thanks, Olivia, uh, for bringing this case study to life for us. I do want to emphasize that one surprising finding, again, was that sometimes the most polished ad isn't the most effective. So don't let amateur graphic design skills stop you from promoting your message and rallying troops behind your cause. 
So with that, I will turn it over to Spencer, who will uh, help facilitate our Q&A. Awesome. So this is our second of our three set aside Q&As. So I have two questions that I noticed in the chat box, and then we'll, we, can, we have time to take one more. So um, one of the questions is, are hashtags effective at the local level? And then what makes a good hashtag? So I can maybe take this first, Manuel, and you can add on to it as well. Sure. Uh, hashtags are an important aspect of Twitter. Uh, I think if you are doing a hyper-local post or a national one, thinking about what hashtags are relevant and active in your local community is really important. So for most states, New Hampshire included, there are sort of the reoccurring hashtags that organizations use, especially around like legislation. Uh, here in Washington state, it's the hashtag WA, L-E-G, WA Ledge uh, as a legislature. Uh, New Hampshire politics is one of the important ones that we're aware of in New Hampshire. So definitely uh, before you're going to launch, especially like any sort of organizing effort where you're trying to reach new people on Twitter, is to spend a little time researching what hashtags are doing well. And when you're even on the account, you can see what's trending. So it's one of the ways to even tap into some of the sort of water cooler conversations that are playing out on Twitter is to see what's, what's already like the top 10 uh, trending hashtags or conversations in your area. And that's a helpful way to even uh, meet some new uh, people online as well. So I would say what makes uh, a good hashtag um, is one that's short, uh, shorter the better. Again, on Twitter, you have a pr very rigid character count limit that you have to uh, work around. But also it's best to sometimes not reinvent the wheel. Uh, so think about what hashtags already exist that you can uh, opt into. We're happy to also help groups uh, think about what hashtags are already in use or help develop new ones. Uh, we have a running list where we track many of them that are specific to democracy reform. Uh, so I definitely recommend before you create a new one, unless it's really tied to a specific campaign, see if there's one that you can also tap into as well. Uh, Manuel, anything you want to add on, on that question? Um, no, just want to reemphasize the case study that Spencer kind of walked us through on HR1, part of what makes that successful is that we had a hashtag or s several hashtags that people could use to uh, during that during that tweet storm to kind of amplify and get it trending. Um, and that and also that like, there's there's Twitter has done some studies and research that shows that the more hashtags you use, um, sometimes the better. So you don't have to like, try to, you know, wreck your brain trying to figure out that perfect hashtag that's short and, and, and sweet and simple, but you can think of a number of them that can be used um, together or interchangeably. And so the other question I have here is, uh, who reads Twitter? So I just want to actually quickly return to this slide that Manuela shared here, which breaks it down a little bit in this uh, chart. So Twitter, you can see younger people are more likely to be engaged on Twitter um, than others. I would also say that we know that Twitter is most used and it's like the go-to resource for reporters. Elected officials are relatively active on it. And while there are millions of people that have a Twitter account, a small number of those users generate the vast majority of tweets on Twitter. There's a very active uh, very energized base on Twitter um, that's very different than what we see on, on Instagram or Facebook, where there's many people that use it. But Twitter, I think there's, there's more diehard supporters. Spencer, um, if I could just clarify, I uh, was the one who asked that question. I wasn't asking, you know, like, is it mostly journalists or whatever, diehards, but how do you get someone to read your Twitter? Like Donald okay. Trump has a million followers. <laughs> if one of us like me suddenly like now starts trying to use Twitter as an advocacy tool, how does, how does anyone get to know that they might want to read my Twitter feed as a, how do they even see it? Excellent question. Uh, Manuela, do you want to take that one first? Or you want me to, to provide some guidance? Go for it and I can add on. Okay, great. So, well, prime, tool number one are using hashtags. So if you want to engage specific audience, get them to read your content, join the conversation they're using, they're very likely using specific hashtags for those conversations. Really, really, really key. I would say also is think about what, how you're using Twitter. Um, the tweets that seem to thrive are pithy, Sarcasm goes well on uh, Twitter. Um, it's a great place to have a strong sense of humor. 
outrage, you know, triggering emotional reactions in folks really thrives on Twitter. Um, so think about how you're constructing them. And then also another way that I, some folks have had success kind of building their own profiles on Twitter, um, I guess it depends on, on how you're trying to market yourself, is to spend the time to develop your own profile. Make sure you have an image of yourself, a bio, especially if you want to come off as sort of a trusted voice on an issue, make sure your, your profile actually represents you well. Um, and then another way is uh, when there are those tweets, you know, you think of President Trump's or others, comment on them. Like that's where a lot of conversations are playing out on Twitter or in the threads on them. So you shouldn't just be broadcasting messages on Twitter. You should also be engaging with people too. That's a great way to get to establish that relationship. They'll follow you back. You should follow them. But also just like you join in on those conversations on Twitter as well. Uh, Manuela? Yeah, I think that's all great. I guess I would just emphasize that very last point, which is that you, know, you might have a Twitter account and you may have a few hundred or so followers. And if you're tweeting from your, your account, just, you know, in the ether, only those 200 or so followers may see it. Um, and then you're relying on them to engage, to like it or to retweet it. But if you're following Donald Trump or some other influencer, a person with, 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 with millions of followers and you reply to, you reply, uh, to their tweet or you retweet and quote tweet, which is basically retweeting and then writing something on top of it. And then other folks see that, um, and like it and more, more folks are likely you're basically getting more eyes on your, on your tweets. And so it has the, the potential to go even further. Excellent. So we're going to move to the next section and please continue to put questions in the chat box and we do have time at the end for additional questions. So I'm going to pass it back to Manuela, who's now going to shift a bit to talk about how do we message uh, effectively on social media to actually engage and, and activate people. Great. Thanks, Spencer. So back to messaging a bit. We know good messages are important to drive action, as Spencer showed us earlier, but what makes a good message to drive action around why we should get um, big money out of politics. In 2014 and 2015, we commissioned a research study to find out just that. We partnered with a number of polling firms to help us determine how the public was already talking about money in politics and what messages would help shift the conversation from inaction to action. So let's get into it. First, some top findings. First top finding is that the public understands there is a problem. They're on our side. But, however, they are cynical about the solutions. How many of you can relate to that? Do you feel like um, you have to communicate through cynicism when talking to people about issues you care about? Or do, you, or, or do most people that you talk to are optimistic about the, about the, the solutions and the potential for change? Share those in the chat. Um, a third major uh, finding is that we, have to, we should avoid the corruption frame as much as we can. Why? Because it helps our opposition more than it helps us. And it, and it just reinforces the sense that the problem is too overwhelming and um, to actually combat and beat. So what should we do instead? We should talk about a sh our shared vision, what we would like our political system to be able to accomplish and produce for us if we want, which is a more reflective and more re representative democracy uh, for all, uh, one that's driven by people power and not corporate power. And so while the corruption frame is a popular frame, one that we all kind of understand intuitively, it's not a good one. Um, but we know that frames actually help make a, a message effective and make, and, make it, and make it good. So which frame should we use instead? Glad you asked. We're, let's, we're gonna cover the top four frames for talking about money and politics. So let's start with the first one. So our first key frame is what we call system out of balance. One way to talk about the problem of big money in politics and the solutions that can fix it is to use the analogy of big money in politics, creating a system that's out of balance. People inherently understand the concept of a balanced beam, and if our political system was one, big money kind of tilt, tilts it um, so, so, so that it loses its balance, and it tilts it in favor of one side, in this case, wealthy special interests, over everyday people. It's a system that only works for some and not all, and therefore is out of balance. It's a clear message, it's simple message, and inherent in this frame is also a good description of both the problem and the solution. That success and win winning means restoring balance back to uh, the system uh, through some kind of policy uh, change. So here's an example uh, of a current elected official and how he used the system out of balance frame. 
and the impact it has when we can restore balance to, an, uh, to our political system. He says, in my first year in the House, I introduced legislation to repeal the death penalty. And in my first term in the Senate, I championed reforms to policing, including body cameras, not issues freshmen in either chamber could do in the big money system. The balance of power completely shifted back to the people. Pretty inspiring. So let's move to our second key frame, which is equal voice, equal say. This one's pretty self-explanatory. You've probably seen it before. It encapsulates the ideas of inclusion and fairness, key tenets in our democracy, and core values that most Americans already share and inherently understand. By framing and discussing the problem and solution to big money in politics as one where everyone having an equal voice and equal say um, is it, uh, no longer under threat, we can confidently move diverse, act, diverse audiences to see what's at stake and to take action to uh, course correct our political system. And here's an example of using the equal voice, equal say frame from a campaign, democracy campaign in New York. They say, it is critical that New York State implement a system of public financing of elections to encourage candidates for public office to listen to constituents and help Black people, particularly those that are poor and working class, have their voices heard in the political system. Who can be against that, right? So our third key frame is barriers to running. The barriers to running frame is effective because it gets people to imagine what our political system could produce if people from all walks of life could easily run for office. But unfortunately, we don't live in that world because big money is a big barrier to running for everyday people without access to a big bank account or with our wealthy connections. So instead, focusing, so instead of focusing on the problem and overwhelming people even further, which we don't want to do, we present a vision of the future. Uh, barriers where barriers to running are eliminated uh, and big money is eliminated and candidates for office are truly representative of uh, the people that put them there or, or elect them. So here's an example of how New, the New Hampshire Rebellion, which you're probably familiar with, used the barriers to running frame in a Facebook post. And they said in 2017, happy national run for day office, run for office day. Today, a coalition of groups are celebrating the fact that anyone and everyone should consider running for office. Representative democracy matters. And in order for under, underrepresented communities to see new leaders in office, then everyone should have the chance to run without the barriers that money creates, allowing only the wealthy and well-connected to run. So uh, let's quickly wrap up with our last key frame, which is price we pay. This one helps us bridge money and politics to other issues we care about, like the environment or gun safety or criminal justice reform. And luckily for us, it has a simple, simple formula, uh, which goes, when wealthy special interests have their way, we all pay the price with, insert a key issue you care about. Perhaps it's the environment. So you'd say, when wealthy special interests have their way, we all pay the price with toxic air and, wa and water, or we all pay the price with multiple mass shootings or harsh, harsher sentencing. So I'm curious what other key issue you might connect money and politics to or have done in the past that you found uh, effective. Um, feel free to share those in the chat. And while you do, let's take a look at, at an example from independent party nominee for governor in Oregon uh, in 2018 and how he used the price we pay, uh, pay frame. He says, as a school board member in rural Oregon for over 10 years, I saw the price we pay when big money influences every issue in Salem. Corporate polluters rolling back clean air protections, pharmaceutical companies writing healthcare policy, and more. So I know that was a lot, but here are some final thoughts on messaging. One, it's always uh, helpful to craft a broader democracy narrative. And the reason for this is because, sorry, I'm having trouble with my screen. There we go. This is because most people are not single issue Americans, right? We care about a number of things, not just public financing or democracy reform. And the price we pay, as the price we pay example shows, um, sorry, I'm screen this. So as the price we pay example shows, 
for some reason I'm Do you want me to jump in, Manuel? Uh, yeah, that would be helpful. For whatever reason, yeah. this, my screen is going back to full screen, so I'm not <laughs> able to see my no presentation notes. Yeah, so it's important to use uh, frames like the price we pay as examples to show people who care about many different issues that impact their daily lives, how they're interconnected. And using a broader democracy narrative allows us to use the same villains, which in a lot of our uh, challenges are powerful, wealthy special interests, lobbyists, um, corporate CEOs and others. It's also helpful to craft a broad narrative because our movement is stronger when we are united. For example, when we connect the dots between money and politics and voting rights or money and politics and judicial independence, we're just stronger together and speaking in the same direction. And remember to always lead with values. Uh, some of the top around democracy reform are equal voice, accessibility, freedom, you know, fit free and fair elections, the freedom to vote, and integrity. And it helps frame why we should care and helps anchor our message with a positive and appealing vision for our shared futures. Uh, Manuel, are you still there? Do you wanna? Okay. Um, so we want to wrap up uh, before we go into Q&A with some quick final tips and tricks of the trade. So there are two ways to engage audiences online, uh, persuasion and calls to action. Persuasion is the work of changing hearts and minds and calls to action are getting those folks whose hearts and minds are already made up to do something about it. So I think it's really important to think about that when you're thinking about the, the messaging you're putting out there on social media. And that really has to do with what audiences you're, you're trying to engage and activate. Persuasion and calls, to, uh, and calls to action compel you to engage different kinds of audiences, those who are, you are trying to persuade versus your allies or your base who you hope to take immediate action. So how you engage dif uh, differs based on those different tactics. So for example, if you're trying to persuade something that requires time, repetition, and storytelling in order to sort of get folks to a place where you already are. Now, if you have an immediate urgent action that needs someone to take place, it's probably best to tap into those networks you have of folks that already uh, share the same beliefs as you, and you just need to activate them uh, to take that action now. And then uh, the last tip is that we want to make it easy and fun for people to join. So provide templates uh, to your friends and family so they can just easily plug and play and copy and paste, especially if you're organizing events like tweet storms, or tag friends in your posts or in your photos so that you make sure that they actually see it. They'll get a notification about that. It's an easy way to call them in to join you. And finally, always make sure that you're telling people how to help and how to engage. And lastly, uh, be creative and experiment. Don't be afraid to try new things and test new methods. You never know, you could help set the next big trend in engaging audiences online. Um, and now is a great time to embrace experimentation as recent events have required all of us to innovate and connect and do our work differently. So before we wrap, we want to uh, reserve some time for some last questions here. Um, and looking at the chat box, uh, there was one question I noticed, and I apologize if, I'm, if I missed some of yours. Um, why do some, what, what thoughts do we have about why some of the democracy images, I think to what Olivia shared earlier, were more effective than others? So I can maybe add a couple comments about this and Olivia or Manuela, feel free to chime in. One thing that we definitely have seen repeat over and over again on social media is, is sometimes the most polished, most well, you know, expensive, well-produced content doesn't perform as well as content that looks more real to folks, more organic and, and, and driven by real human beings and sort of some sort of like marketing firm or it's, it's overly done. So that's one of the reasons. I think that's something to embrace, especially if you're stepping into doing your own video content or graphic design, is it doesn't need to look perfect to perform well. And sometimes if it actually looks too polished, it performs worse than the stuff that looks a little bit quicker and put together, uh, which is just a fascinating uh, outcome of social media. Olivia, do you want to add any, any comments from what you learned from those digital ads? Yeah, I mean, I think the the New Hampshire values democracy with a picture of, of local town halls, and they were all New Hampshire town halls. So if you've been to the Exeter town hall, they were town halls 
in the communities that we were targeting. So it was also an image that people I felt like are, were that knew about it. So we were targeting people in Exeter to call their state senator and we put a picture of Exeter Town Hall. So I think, I think one, it was hopeful and two, it was an image they were more comfortable with. Um, I think that's why it performed better in that case, in that specific example. Excellent, thanks, Olivia. Um, any other last questions around social media, digital organizing, or the messaging frames that Manuela walked us through? You didn't talk uh, anything about um, connecting with groups across the nation. I know because I, I lived in Seattle and Washington. I have lots of relatives there. I have lots of relatives in California. So I've connected with Indivisible in those groups in Boston, in Florida, because I have friends there. So my messages that go out, go out to all these groups, if they're nationwide messages. Um, the one I sent in August was about having your kids um, register to vote and getting their long distance, you know, uh, uh, with their town hall so that they were able to get their absentee ballots before you sent them off to school. I had over half of a million people respond to the blast. I made a meme, three lines, and it went everywhere. Um, and, and it was just amazing. I was just dumbfounded with how many people that resonated with. Um, uh, and it's, you, you, don't, you didn't talk much about that, connecting with groups across. I mean, I know how to connect with groups in my own state, but many um, voting rights issues, democracy issues are all nationwide, and that we need to reach that huge nation. Um, and I don't know if you have anything to put in about that. No, I mean, I think that's a really great point, is that, uh, I mean, there's times where you're just going to be posting stuff, you're taking action as an individual, but also keep in mind, how can you organize others? And sometimes that's organizing your local community, but also a bigger network. And so um, I think tips for success, you can go ahead and, and tag them on Twitter, tag, tag them on Facebook, but it's always best if you know who to contact there to help line up that sharing. So like, for example, whenever we host any collective uh, tweet storms or just days of action on social media, we tend to do a lot of organizing on the front end to organize folks to get those out. Cause you can get like, especially for organizations, they can go ahead and schedule that Facebook post, schedule that uh, Twitter post well in advance of doing so. And so some of that sort of um, just leveraging that personal one-on-one -on -one connections to help activate folks to show up at the right moments is, is really, 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 really key. And I think if you create something that gets a lot of attention, uh, is tapped into uh, a topic that's really relevant right now, it's a really easy ask to get other organizations around the country to, to join and help amplify the content. I know we're always looking for content that is created by more everyday people than by you know, those of us who are professional communicators, because those are the great thing, uh, stories we want to lift up and, and share online. But I think to oh. Sherry's point around timeliness too, she, was, she posted it right as kids were going off to campus. So sort of was a time, the, the right, sometimes the right content at the right moment yep. also matters. A mm -hmm. couple of comments and a, and a, uh, a question from Jim here. Uh, I, I, I see I view things like the New York Times and Wall Street Journal and American Conservative and even Yahoo and uh, Politico reader responses, sometimes numbering in the hundreds and thousands as being a, a type of social media. And for a certain type of audience uh, where you're actually wrestling with, with issues, you know, in a deeper way, deeper thoughtful way, since the, the first three that I mentioned there are really good, Yahoo and Politico are, are mostly dumb, dumb, you know, vitriolic, uh, you know, comments back and forth. But if you look at some of the quality media, there is good engagement and quality wrestling with, with topics and issues on, on some of those media. So I would include... I would include reader comments for a certain type of audience. That'd be comment number one. A comment number two is a Republican conservative. Some of the messaging used that you've illustrated here doesn't really work for, for conservatives, Republicans. So for example, a, a conservative thinks that people who have more power deserve it. And therefore an argument that uh, every voice should be equal to the deserving voice doesn't make any sense. 
So the, the methods of communication, and as we, as we know, as we look at the, our ability to, to reach and engage people across the political spectrum, we've had a much tougher time reaching Republicans, particularly in Congress, and, and uh, need to reflect, reflect that in messaging that are uh, driven by values that are different. And finally, a question. We've got this corona, coronavirus 19. How, how can we connect that right now to our issue? What, what, what ideas pop out right now, particularly messaging ideas? Uh, well, it's a great question and a question that Manuel and I and many other uh, folks are grappling with every day. Uh, yeah. so we've actually been working on a series of additional uh, toolkits with some specific mm. talking points and message guidance. Right now, the emphasis has really been around voter accessibility, less so than focusing on money in politics, although there are many stories we're seeing where we can connect the dots back to that. Um, so we could definitely provide to you all, there's a link to a, another resource on our website where we've been putting mm. together all of the message toolkits that we put out there, others have put out there to help mm. connect the dots to the uh, pandemic, the healthcare crisis we're experiencing now, and what has been more of an urgent request from uh, organizations in our network, which is on how do we preserve and protect the accessibility, the safety and the integrity of our elections this year. So we're happy to give those specific talking points, but it's really important to just connect the dots together and also just acknowledge that we're living in a time that's um, testing our systems that are currently oh. in place. And it's important for us to do the work now to preserve the accessibility, the safety, and, and it's not a choice between keeping voters safe, poll workers safe, and having a, an, an, uh, an honest and fair and accurate election. So we can send more of that guidance. Um, and we're going to be developing more as we move Great. forward. Love, love to see that link. Love to see that link. Jim, just some initial thoughts on your question. I think the coronavirus has exposed some weaknesses in our democracy. Like you can't register to vote here in New Hampshire right now. And I think it's important that I think the framing around we've exposed weaknesses and we got to come out of this coronavirus with a stronger democracy is a way to connect those dots. But I also have, you know, to your, I, I retweeted you today. Yeah. And I think that's a really also important framework that, you know, that you posted on Twitter today. And, um, and the thing about the special interests were lining up for the bailouts. Um, <laughs> yeah. And that's got to be, it be something that people are ha can resonate with as well, connecting mm -hmm. what's going on um, nationally as well. But that's 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 negative. That's uh, I'm, 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 I'm hearing the uh, recommendation here. If we just talk about corruption, why it's corrupt, we uh, we don't engage. Is there a way to use that corruption, which we're seeing now, to uh, link to the positive outcomes, the positive action that? that our, our hosts, our presenters are, are seeking to get from us? I mean, that's another great question. And um, when you look into the guidance that we can provide, it's yep. very focused on what we want to accomplish. So we are yep. trying to make sure we're not coming off as, as tone deaf by getting too into the, the problem. I mean, there's a, people are feeling the problem right now. And so yeah. we're looking for solutions uh, and urgency Urgently and more and more, especially with Wisconsin's uh, primary this week, there's a lot more attention being spent on um, how are my elections going to be impacted by this and what, what is my state doing right now? What is my federal government doing right now? And what, what are the needs? And so um, I think one of the key things thing is not just the message, but who's the messenger on these issues. And so mm -hmm. definitely need for more secretaries of state, auditors, elections officials, to uh, raise their voices right now and talk about some of those challenges. A lot of states are very concerned about the lack of funding, um, whether that's to expand absentee vote, mail-in voting, um, protecting poll workers, recruiting new poll workers um, in this climate. And so uh, I would think about both, not just the message, but who, who is the messenger to help engage new Yeah, I'm, I'm migrating into brainstorming here, but can, can we engage uh, doctors and healthcare professionals to become oh, right now? I think that's a good strategy. I think people would trust trust those voices more than you know political activists. 
Well, a great point. And I think there, there's a lot of organizing happening. And I know that some of those voices you just named are definitely going to be voices that uh, na especially national organizations are working to lift up right now. Yeah, good. So um, I know we're over time. So uh, to just kind of move us along a little bit, and I do want to reemphasize, and we'll give you uh, both my and uh, Manuela's email addresses. So please don't hesitate to follow up with us with additional questions, troubleshooting tutorials, challenges you're having, and we'll make sure that Olivia has a set of resources to share with you all afterwards. But I did want to give a quick shout out to one of those resources that we'll uh, be providing you all with, which is a digital copy of our social media workbook that's specific to democracy advocates. So in there are a lot of the information we just presented to you all, but there's also some helpful checklists to help you develop your daily, weekly, and once in a while kind of editorial calendar for your um, social media content. There's also additional resources that we spotlight, including some helpful tips around um, Twitter uh, managers to help kind of organize the flow of content, um, free graphic design programs, including Canva and how to use them. And then there's a worksheet at the end to help guide you through uh, some structured questions to develop your strategy to help guide the social media tactics that you'll deploy to help achieve your goals. Um, so here's our email addresses. Again, please uh, take note of these, follow up with us if there's additional questions. But we really wanna thank you all for joining us today. Really great conversation, uh, excellent questions, and definitely see us at Rethink as a, as a resource for the future. Um, so thank you all.